In this episode, you'll learn how to keep service design simple and why being kind is a very smart and effective design strategy. And finally, why you should avoid doing research at the start of your project at all costs. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hey, I'm Lincoln and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is Lincoln Nager. Lincoln uh, used to be a service designer for the city of Austin in Texas, USA, and he's the co-founder of a service design meetup in Austin where they organized a service design hustle for homelessness. Now, let's be honest, most people just practice the design process as it's described in the books. They follow the steps from research to insights to ideation to prototyping and maybe scaling up. But the question is, is that really the best process and the right steps for your project? The reason why I'm so excited to have Lincoln on the show today is that he has a very hands-on and very fast um, approach and practice of service design. So it's a bit different than it's described in the books. And I think that at the end of this episode, you'll not only have learned a few new tools and methods that could be really useful in your next project, but also um, start to question and uh, think critically about the steps you're taking in your projects, in your design process. Are those really the best steps? Do you really need to take these steps or is there a smarter approach? So that's what you're going to get if you stick around till the end of this episode. If this is your first time here on this channel, I'd love to welcome you and let you know that we bring a new video on how to level up your service design skills at least once a week. So if you're interested in that, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell icon so you'll be notified when new episodes are out. That's all for the intro. And now let's quickly jump into the chat with Lincoln. Welcome to the show, Lincoln. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Awesome. Uh, <laughs> I already gave a short introduction uh, before we dived into the chat right now. But for the people who don't know you, could you give like a short intro? Who is Lincoln? Sure. Who am I? Wow, that's so <laughs> existential. Um, OK, yeah, I'm a service designer. I live in Austin, Texas, and I've most recently been working in, with the city of Austin around homelessness and um, understanding how services are coordinated around that experience. Uh, in the U.S., we have a big homelessness issue here. Um, affordability and housing are huge at the top of our list of problems across cities. Um, and so that's been the work I've been doing most recently that involved a lot of uh, people working with people experiencing homelessness and understanding where they're coming from. Um, and finding ways to get their voice put into the policy discussion and put into how services are actually uh, operating and how they're, how they're structured in order to support the homelessness experience more effectively. Um, I've also been working with an organization called Civic IO, who does an annual summit uh, during South by Southwest. And that's where we bring um, U.S. mayors from across the country together to introduce them to innovation practices and innovation practitioners. Uh, so that they can um, interact with new ideas a little bit more fluidly mm -hmm. than when they're <clears throat> than when they're usually working um, as as mayors in their cities. So it's kind of like a vacation for mayors to come do fun stuff <laughs> <laughs> during South by Southwest. <laughs> um, so that's yeah. uh, one of the things I've been doing. And are you also running a meetup in Austin? Yes. Yeah. 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 We've been on a bit of a hiatus since I've been traveling. I was just in Europe for a few months. Um, and, uh, we've been on hiatus. We're, we're picking it back up this month. Um, and we do a meetup every month for the past, almost like, I think it's been four years. Hmm. We do a meetup, uh, and we're really focused on transferring skills. So making sure that people get to interact with the tool. We often practice the tool, figure it out. We talk about it beforehand. And then we, uh, the people I founded the meetup with, uh, the co-founders and I, we come up with, a with a really interactive workshop to be able to figure that out, um, to be able to play with the tool and, and think about it and, and have that experiential understanding so that people feel more comfortable taking it into their daily life. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. And that's been so much fun. <laughs> I, I know. I, I've been doing them in the Netherlands for quite a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's fun to actually get people engaged in the design process. Um, for sure. 
Do you, Lincoln, remember the very first time you learned about service design? Ah, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I really like this story. I was at school for industrial design, for product design um, at SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia. And I love SCAD, great school. <laughs> We've and had many people was, from SCAD here, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's, it's a good program. I think it's one of the first in the US too for service design and it's been, I was mm. there right when it was starting. Ooh, good timing, because I was there to study industrial design. I had, you know, in high school had decided, ooh, industrial design, product design, I love things. I love how that all comes together. I love creating useful products. And I was about two quarters of the, half, halfway through my, uh, my industrial design degree and I took this foundational service design class called contextual research and it blew my mind and I could see so easily that this was what I was interested in. The research part was really what fueled me and what excited me and finding things out of research, finding opportunities out of research and realizing that there are so many ways that you can help people that have nothing to do with mm. making something. Mm. It has nothing to do with creating a product to put on the earth to help people. It's about making systems better it's about making the service more more exciting it's about branding it's about marketing it's about yeah, this confluence yeah. of all these different things coming together and that was the first time i saw that and i think the next day i decided to double major in industrial <laughs> design and service design because i was so far through the industrial design degree yeah, yeah. and that's like where my heart is it's like this aesthetic thing that i absolutely love um And I and I learned so much process from industrial design too as well. Sure. That's really yeah. where, where yeah. process is is you know it's so important to under to iterate to to prototype. That's like built. It's foundational to industrial design. Um, and so bringing that into service design, it's really helped me see design from a theoretical and philosophical perspective, and having both of those angles pointed at what I'm working on. And I love it. And so that's where service design. That's where it came from. And I majored in it and it's just been so exciting working in that field um and watching it grow i think when i started majoring in it there was not another program in the u.s for sure mm -hmm. and this was before ux design was a thing and mm. people the 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 industry was talking about service design you could see it in the blogs oh this thing called service design it's coming from europe service design service design <laughs> it's so fancy and and then um probably like a year into my program Uh, the the user experience designer came out and it kind of swallowed mm. what service design was and mm. now and now it's rising to the now now it's it's coming up again and and we can see the difference between UX design and service design because many people have gotten to the point of 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 understanding those differences and and there's so many more people who have a basis in design to be able to to tell the difference mm. so it's great. Great, <laughs> and, and I'm sure they will be happy to hear this, Sket, that that you're so still so excited <laughs> about uh, the course back then. Yeah, nice. Abs absolutely. Yeah, it was great. It was phenomenal. Robert Bow was my professor. He's at Fjord now. He was so incredible. Yep, great. Maybe great, we great need to program. get him on the show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Lincoln. So. I really, we did a chat uh, to sort of prepare for this episode, and I really like mm -hmm. your, let's say, different take on service design, your different approach to it, a little bit. Uh, it's a different kind of practice, and I think we're going to dig into <laughs> that in uh, in the topics. So let's do some interview jazz. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely ready. <laughs> All right, okay. So the first topic is keep it simple. Do you have a question starter and can you show it up? Yeah, I got that. What if? What if? Yeah, okay, let's see. What if designers, what if service designers kept design simple instead of complicated? I think that we have a tendency to overcomplicate things. I mean, put simply, <laughs> um, <laughs> we really... We really have a have a tendency to sit and here are all the parts of the, of the thing we're working on. This is how they all fit together. We're very precise with our speech, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. But I think we have the tendency to overcomplicate things and make it hard for everyone to understand. One of my my biggest beliefs about design is that it must be accessible. It's an it's a tool for inclusion. It's a tool for for um, working toward an end goal with many people. And in that, we need to make it simple because everyone needs to be able to understand it. Everyone needs to be able to follow it and see how it's working. 
So the second we add too many too many elements in it, the second we add too many layers or or too much theory to the design process, it inherently becomes inaccessible and is hard for people to to work with. It's hard mm. for them to grasp. It's hard for them to to really uh, to follow the process and and feel included. And and in that, if it gets too complicated. Uh, we end up alienating the people that we're trying to pull into the process. So what would be like a stereotypical example of uh, the design process being too overly complicated? Like, wh wh where do you feel it's mm. too complicated? Oh, that's, that's, that's a, <laughs> I feel like I've been working to dismantle the design process and put it back together. Um, and one of these things, which I think we'll probably get into later is, um, a lot of the design research deliverables and the process around mm -hmm. design research, I think, can be really heavily simplified and focused on doing and mm -hmm. creating something mm -hmm. rather than investigating and interrogating a okay. concept. Um, because when when we interrogate something, any well, you know, interrogation that word, the word that I'm using, you seize up, right? You you get kind of frozen. You're you're might feel like in the city we use the word audit a lot. Like mm -hmm. you're feeling like you're audited. Everyone's looking through all your files and making sure that everything's going okay. Um, a lot of people in an ecosystem will will kind of seize up and freeze when they when they start feeling like they're being watched. Um, whereas if you start feeling like you're playing with someone, if you're using play to to kind of engage someone, those people end up being more accepting to mm -hmm. the idea mm -hmm. they, they get a little bit more excited they feel more included and like and as if you're using their their knowledge and their expertise to to move something forward um so that's kind of one of the examples i would use and and have you what is your um take on where this complexity is coming from uh, what is driving yeah what is making design more complex is it inherent? i think it's just yeah? I think it's just the human condition to try mm. to make sense of things. And I think a lot of what's one thing I've noticed about designers across the globe is that they're exceptionally nice people. <laughs> they're, they're, they're engaged, they're interested, they're, they're wondering what's going on. They're, they're often up to speed on, on, um, political happenings. They're, they're very curious about the world and they're very nice, nice and curious, nice and curious. Those mm. would be two words I would mm. use. Mm. Um, and in that, I think, Oh, I've lost my train of thought at this point. Let's see. Nice and curious. <laughs> yeah, and and what was the question uh, where's again? complexity? Where is this complexity coming from? Yeah. Okay. Right. So I think that in that people are trying to designers are often trying to make sense of things for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. As they're they're trying to make sense of, of of a system so that they can explain it to everyone across that system. And I think there's this niceness to design where people are are trying to make sense of everything, and and the designers, you know speaking things that are that are trying to make sense they're using language they're finding the right words to describe something and so i think that designers kind of that, that can get very complex at times when we're trying to put so much language into one little one little thing a couple design deliverables once you introduce a blueprint let's you know you want to talk about complexity let's talk about blueprints boom whoa they're so helpful they're so great they're so useful and helpful but how do we make it so that Blueprints are a little bit more accessible, a little mm. bit easier to follow. Um, the, the, the information and the ideas leading up to the blueprint, you know, how do we work on those and make it easy to, so that when the blueprint does come, it's easier to work with. Yeah, and I, um, the, the, the thought that comes to my mind is like one of the things designers should be really good at is hiding complexity, like sort of mm -hmm. cutting through complexity, getting to the essence and sort of presenting that to the people who aren't experts. And I think we're doing that really well uh, with the solutions that we're creating, but maybe we should also sort of redesign the design process. And, <laughs> and, 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 right? Yeah, I think so. I think the way I look at it is there are a few things we can do. There are a few assumptions we can make about our, our approach to design that can really cut some of the, the a lot of the work, mm. a lot of the really, really hard work, grueling, tedious work out of design. Like, um, one of those yeah. things being co-creation. So co-creation is so important to my design process. I don't like to design unless I have the users with me working on the product. That's not something that I. <laughs> that's not something that I'm. Um, that's something that I'm very very focused on. And so co-creation is a big thing. If we are leaning on co-creation as a foundational principle of our of our design process, then 
we can really lean on the expertise and the understanding of our users in that system. Mm -hmm. That means that the designer does not have to take the time to understand those so fluidly, so fluently. That's something that we have time. We're trusting the people that we're working with to bring in their, their expertise and their knowledge. And we as the designers kind of keep an eye on things to, to measure any dissonance, to measure anything that's going wrong. Um, and and try to try to resolve things that we see are going wrong. And I think that's one of the designer's role is to shepherd that process, right. to, to help people through the co-creation process feel comfortable enough to to interact and, and provide their expertise because we could not do our jobs without it. <laughs> hmm. So I think um, I think replacing research with co-creation activities is an incredibly um, useful way to avoid this complexity within design. That's already a really good uh, tip. And I, I would urge and uh, invite people to actually prototype this, to, te to test this and see, Please. see, see how the, <laughs> what kind of results you get. I'd love to hear about that, yeah. So, so do I. Uh, but Linko, we have to move on to the second topic. And it uh, links to the previous one because you said uh, designers are curious and nice. Well, this one is about being kind and do you have a question mm -hmm. starter that goes along with this one yeah i have this how can we how can we yeah okay i like okay so how can we spread kindness and excitement about design throughout throughout a, throughout an ecosystem i think that's really important um, one of the things we i've talked about where this be kind came from is uh, how impactful it is on your work and on the success of your work when you're just nice to the people that you're working with when you're kind to them. And one of the examples I use here is something I call service design gift. And that's where when you're a service designer and you're walking into any situation, I'm sure you can see a million things that can go that can happen to make things a little mm, bit more, mm. e a little easier for the person who's working, a little bit more effective, a little bit more exciting. So do some of those things, right? We it, our, our brain works so quickly, let's do something. You see how a spreadsheet might work to, to fix something. Make, maybe you give them a Google form instead of a, a clunky email spreadsheet. Sure. Great, do it for them. Maybe they don't use it, but you made that gift for them. And as you create more gifts for this office, um, I'll, I'll use an example with um, a permitting project I worked on. We worked on a project with the city to help make residential permitting, which um, when you want to make uh, an improvement on your house, you need to get it permitted, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> we helped make that service a little bit more understandable and consumable. And a lot of that was my job. A lot of my job on that project was sitting in the office with everyone and working with them to help them understand. And sometimes a prototype is a gift. I know that there was one prototype we worked with, prototype we worked with, that um, just mapped out the time that people take to, to do their job. And people hadn't been able to see that in sure. so long. Mm -hmm. They hadn't been able to see that. And they were able to see, oh, I'm spending a week over here doing this, but I could spend that week down here. Wow. Or if I do this mm. over, it just being able to visualize the process in itself is a gift. And we were able to make these things for them or, or even business cards with their website on it. Cause they're like, what are they saying over and over again while they're working? Let's give them a pamphlet that takes us 10 minutes to make it. Let's give it to them and they can use it for as much as they want. I think that's a really good uh, criterion for when you're engaged in the design process. Like every deliverable uh, you uh, create, uh, if, it's, if it's received as a gift, then I think you're doing an awesome job as a service designer, <laughs> right? Every, the, the, maybe that should be the benchmark. Like every deliverable <laughs> should be received as a gift, should be perceived yeah. as a gift. <laughs> I because, love that. I made yeah, this. Here's this present for you. Here's yeah, it. yeah. Well, here, here's your customer journey map. Well, that would be that would be interesting when people can start to uh, see that as a as a gift. And I th <laughs> I think you also said something about um, that it it's it's not a trick being kind, but it's like it. Uh, um, it helps the design process later on. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yes, absolutely. So I think, so if we use this project that I was working on before, um, the permitting project, there was another service design project around this, this service that had come in about a year, to, a year or two before I had come in. And um, everyone in the office had a bitter taste in their mouth, hmm. their mouth about it. They weren't really excited about what we were working on. Um, they didn't really pick up on the excitement that we were having about the project because of this experience that they had. 
But because I had built relationships with everyone in the office and knew them by name and had spent time sitting in the office with them, um, you know, prototyping in, in C2 on, on site with them, uh, they had they were much more willing to hear about what the solution was. They were much more sure. willing to engage. And it was almost as if they felt they were doing me a favor by working with the product, right? Even though the product was for them, they felt kind of, I don't want to use the word obligated, but they felt... Um, they felt they had a relationship with me and that it would help me if they used this product. And that ended up helping the product live on. Um, the training session that we did with them to help them use the product really went well because they were all sitting there trying to help me, <laughs> mm, <laughs> right? Like, mm. because we had built those relationships. So the better your relationships that you begin at the, that you start at the beginning of a project, the more, the more success your project will sure. experience toward the end. For sure. Yeah, and that's that's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a challenging thing, but you have to experience the fact that investing in relationships, investing mm. in building trust, investing in uh, social capital, that it eventually pays off. But um, you have to be in the position to to have the time to actually build that, and maybe not every service designer, especially external service designers maybe aren't necessarily in that position where they have these opportunities. Sure. And I think that goes to something we spoke about last week, where what is the role of the designer? What, mm. what, what is what is the purpose of, of the designer's job in, in, a, in a system? And I think part of that is bringing energy and excitement to a project. And I think, because I think about um, the successful projects I've been on, I have a pretty um, loud personality. I'm pretty eccentric and, and flamboyant, and it's really helpful to to bring people into the projects that I'm working on um, and, and get them excited about what we're, what we're working on and remember the tricks and, and the tools that we're working with um, because they've had, they've had this energetic experience around it. And so I think that's part of the designer's role is being a character in the mm. design process and helping people, helping people have a face to attach the work to. Um, and I think that that's really, that to me is a really important role for my work as a designer, for sure. And uh, we're talking about being kind and the people listening to the podcast don't see it, but the people on the video might have <laughs> noticed the sign next to you, which says, hi, mom, heart, heart, heart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This may be mom. a service design, <laughs> service design <laughs> gift. I did that. I actually, that's been up there for about two weeks since the first time we scheduled. The, oh, really? The nice. Well, it's ready. That, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good example. That's maybe a small, uh, small service design gift. Um, <laughs> I want to move into topic number three uh, because I suspect that this is a topic where we'll spend most of our time. So are you ready? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I am. And you hinted upon this one already also. And this one is learning by doing. Learn by doing. And I have when will. When will. All right. So let's see. When will we... Double the efficacy of the design process. When will we? When will we make the design process efficient, more efficient, more exciting, more impactful? Um, I ask this question because I feel as though on the projects I've been on, we spend a lot of time um, wondering, right? We, we may, a lot of people will use investigating or or um, discovery, right? Mm -hmm, the discovery mm -hmm. phase of the design mm -hmm. process. And I think what happens is that becomes a bit gratuitous, it becomes a bit selfish for the designer to take their time to understand what's going on in, in the system, right? Uh, because obviously a designer has to orient themselves. If we're working in a, in a new environment, we have to orient ourselves um, to be able to see what's going on, to be able to understand what's around us and use our intuition. But I think, as we said earlier, if we can lean on the people already in that ecosystem, we don't necessarily need to be so well oriented. If we're oriented along the design process or along our design discipline, um, no longer do we have to be so so steeped in the problem, so that uh, other the people who are who are steeped in the problem can can use their expertise to come in and and inform you and let you know. Um, <clears throat> I think so. One of the things that I talk about here is. Uh, how long it takes, how long design research can take. Um, sometimes it can take months. It can take, sure, yeah. it can, I think I've been on projects where we did research for six months and mm -hmm. then we, and then we started talking about doing, and the whole time we were working with people who had been working in this, in this problem space for their careers. And it ends up, it ended up becoming, um, we, we, 
a bit condescending. We were being a bit condescending in this idea of like, let's wait, let's hold off, let's figure out what we're working on. Um, let, let, you know, may, maybe that's what we need. Maybe that's what we need. But let's wait, let's wait, let's wait. And we ended up damaging a lot of our relationships throughout the project for that because people were ready to do something. They had been living in the office. Mm. They had been living with this problem every day. They hear about this new design thing coming at them. They're ready to do something. And we wasted that momentum by pausing and saying, stop, we have to stop. So what's we the alternative? Think, we have to research. I think the alternative is to learn by doing. So let's say, for instance, we have... Um, I don't want to use it for instance here. Let's say we have a project we're working on and, and there's 20 people in this ecosystem. These 20 people have ideas already, right? They have something that they think needs to be done. So let's make some gifts for them. Let's see what's working very, very lightly. You know, this is just a light thing. Let's go into the office for the week, see what they're doing for a week. Okay, let's, we made them a Google form here. We helped them with their website design over here. We figured out their, pan, their marketing, a little bit of their marketing and their, their brochures over here. Now, now, what are some bigger ideas they have? You know, we've built some relationships with them. We've helped them. What are some bigger ideas that they have about how they can fix their workflow and, and, their, and their work? Um, and then start with one of those. But then at that point is when we start learning. So this isn't necessarily the idea, right? This isn't the idea that we're working on. We're working on something to help us learn while also improving and helping the people around us. Because if we take too much time to observe, we end up becoming a part. We end up becoming different. Here's the problem and here we are around mm -hmm, the problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But to be an effective service designer, I think it's really important to wrap yourself into the problem and, and really work toward it. And this is coming from my experience in public service, which is definitely different than private. <laughs> but I think that I've learned a lot about how to, how to work in both of those spheres this way. And I think it's really important to start with a prototype. I mean, prototyping is, is the best way to learn by doing. Um, and the starting point for that can be from the very people that you're working with. And I think it's really important to respect their expertise. It's really important to be, hum be humble and express your humility as a designer. I don't know what we're doing. No, I'm not a social worker. I don't know how homelessness works. I don't know what it's like to be homeless. I don't know what it's like to help people who are homeless. It's not for me to make that decision, but you know, and you can do it. So let's, well, what ideas do you have? You have mm. so much context and understanding and, and experience to bring into this that I don't have. What do you have? And I think that goes back to the designer's role. The designer's role is to pull that out. The designer's role is to say, okay, you have this experience, bring it here. How do, how do we use that experience? I've designed this, this workshop for you to inject your experience into an idea and make sure that we have it. Um, and I think that that's kind of, that's where my head is on that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so I think a lot of people uh, want to do research because um, we've had experiences with clients who think they know who their customers are, but eventually it turns out uh, it's on a quite superficial level. They don't really get to the root of the problem. Uh, it's There are short-term solutions and we want to address mm -hmm. bigger challenges. So um, I think for me, at least, that that's one of the reasons why, you, why I wanted to go out and do research and mm -hmm. yeah, expand the scope. It, how how does that relate to learning by doing for you? So I think that this is a little bit of an exercise for the designer and a little bit of a discussion of design research versus the mindset of a mm. design researcher. So I think as we enter into projects, it's important for everyone on the team to have the mindset of a design researcher, right? We want to bring empathy. We want to bring understanding into a situation. We want to make sure that we're oriented correctly around the problem. And that, to me, is the mindset of a design research design researcher. But as we talk about design research in itself and the acts of design research, I think it's an exercise for the service designer to break apart the design process and put it back together. Let's look at a persona, for example. So as the example you used um, with, with uh, private clients thinking they know their, their customers, but they don't. Um, excuse me. Those, if we look at the persona, which is often the way we communicate those types of things, how can we create the pieces of a persona, the elements of, mm -hmm. of a persona, while also doing generative research? So let's say you, you interview 10 people. Now, now we have a persona based off of those 10 people. But let's say instead of interviewing them, 
you did a more generative research exercise with them. So maybe that's prototyping with them. Let's say like, okay, we're going to bring in, we're going to make something with you. The designer's job now is to translate that experience into a persona. So we're always making assumptions in design research, right? And I think this is another place where we discuss the role of the designer. I think the designer has a little bit of a, of a privilege here to, to, make, to, to make assumptions, make safe assumptions, make comfortable assumptions. So basically what we're doing, instead of making assumptions out of interviews, we're making assumptions out of experiences that we have with the customer. And I think we'll still find the same types of information. We'll still find that we're onto the wrong customer, but we'll find it in a much richer, hmm. future-oriented way. Is how, I, is how I kind of look at that. Yeah, and, and maybe in a, a way that's more engaging to the people who eventually will need to deliver the service or deliver the solution. Absolutely. Something also, if, if we think about this too, um, design, like I talked about design being accessible earlier and mm-hmm. how I think that that's very important. Design can become pretty inaccessible once we start looking at the clinical kind of research that this is how it works. But people interact every day, right? We as people know how to interact. We learn things from our interactions. If you keep the design work around that, the design research work as simple as interacting and working together and, and don't think too far beyond that, it becomes pretty accessible to people working work, that you're working with. If you have a frontline staff, per, a staffer that you're working with, um, explaining this is the question, these are the questions we have to ask, and this is what we have to make sure we get out of it, and all this stuff can bring a lot of anxiety to the situation. Whereas if you say, hey, we're going to put you in a room with someone, and you're going to work on something, and we're going to just all work together and talk about it, they're doing that all the mm. time, every mm. day. That's another thing that I think is very foundational to to my design approach, is that everyone's doing all of this designing stuff every day. The only difference is that we're, we're finding tools and ways to do it as a group and to do it together. But we're all prototyping, we're all iterating, we're all, we're all researching, we're all doing these things, we're all trying to understand, we're all building empathy. Every day we have to, we're humans. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and this is a point I've been trying to get across for a really long time, um, and that is like in service design, implementation is 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 something that goes on every day. And the way you mm-hmm. describe your perspective on the design process, you're, you're implementing every day. There is no implementation stage. The in, implementation is the doing part. It, sure, yeah, correctly? I would totally agree with that. I think services are living, breathing things. Mm-hmm. Although mm-hmm. They're, they're intangible, they're alive. They have <laughs> yeah. to be. So <clears throat> if, we, if we don't feed it every day, if we don't water it every day, it doesn't live. Yeah. So I definitely, I like the way you put that. I haven't thought of it that way. I think um, implementation is definitely a it's constant a, thing. It's, it's exactly. maintenance. It's it, continuous it, you, implementation. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, you, need to get, you need to get the right people in the room to be able to see what tools of service design are useful for their workflow. Managers might use blueprints, whereas frontline staff might use sure. personas more, yeah. right? So these... These things, it's you got to you got to put the right tool in the right hands and 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 build the right relationships too as you're working forward. Hmm. Is there a, a question that you'd like to ask the viewers and listeners of the show that we can think about, help you with? Absolutely. Um, so something I've been I've been working on is how do we design proactively how do we how do we look at industries and look at design proactively and i'll use an example to explain this question Mm -hmm. um as as you know as we talk about the autonomous vehicle and self-driving cars coming out we we in the u.s we talk a lot about our truck drivers Hmm. what the hell are all our truck drivers going to do when we no longer need the driver of the truck and i'm interested what services could exist to help maybe it's about helping truck drivers find new work for themselves that they're interested in. And we find that, oh, this, these are the qualities of the truck driver and these types of people are interested in these types of opportunities and creating training programs for them. Um, but, or maybe it's about, you know, reskilling them in, in other ways. And I'm just really interested in what people have in mind about designing proactively for these social problems that, are, that we can seek. It's coming, mm. Here it's coming, mm. it's mm. coming. Oh shit, mm. what are we gonna do? So we can we can see it coming. How can we design preemptively, proactively to avoid that issue and and um, and manipulate industries to want to help in that problem too at the same time? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so spawning, uh, it's uh, uh, fixing challenges before they become, or fixing problems before they become problems. Absolutely. You mm. know, be smart about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, leave your comments down below. And uh, if people have good examples, uh, we would love to know. Uh, Absolutely. Lincoln, if people uh, want to get in touch with you to continue this conversation, what's the best mm -hmm. way? The best way to interact with me is through email. Um, mm -hmm. or LinkedIn. I do not have a website or, or a social media presence. I've been off social media for about five years now. Um, but, uh, I, oh wait, that's a lie. I have a Twitter. <laughs> so I have a Twitter too. Um, so lincoln.niger at gmail.com, um, at pragmasmic on Twitter, P-R-A-G-M-A-S-M-I-C. I'll link to it. Um, or yeah. you <laughs> or you can, great. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the, the most efficient way to get a hold of me. Oh. But I'd love to chat. I'd love to talk. I'm really interested in in what the world's doing around service design. Um, all that stuff. It's super. I know great. people from Austin are watching and listening. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's see if a few at least uh, reach out. Lincoln. Uh, Thanks for sharing your story and uh, your perspective on the design process. I really appreciate how you are trying to make it more effective and more accessible. I think that's a really uh, um, important uh, quest. Great. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Mark. I really appreciate it. I love what you're doing for service design with the show. Everyone talks about the show. I push this show as often as possible. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a great resource that you're creating and I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely, 100%. Well, thanks for your contribution, man. So what's your biggest takeaway from this episode? Leave your comments down below and we'd love to know. If you enjoyed this episode with Lincoln, consider sharing it with one other person today who might find it helpful as well. That will you'll help to grow the Service Design Show community and help me to invite more inspiring guests like Lincoln for your hair on the show. If you want to continue and get more inspiration, check out this next video because we're going to continue over there. So click over here and I'll see you over there.